This is Dream Power Radio, the place where your dreams turn into reality. Here is your host, Debbie Specter Weissman. Hello, 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 and welcome to Dream Power Radio. I'm your host, Debbie Specter Weissman, the Dream Coach. This is a show where we talk about dreams, both daytime and nighttime dreams. Now, you can use them to make the internal shift to a life you love and rediscover the truth of who you really are. When I started out as a dream life coach, one of my first clients was a woman who came to me concerned about a dream she'd had. At the time, she was the primary caretaker for her grandmother and was upset that she had to send her to an assisted living facility because she couldn't handle all of her medical needs by herself anymore. After about a week, she was distressed to see that her grandmother seemed to be getting worse. The nurse she spoke with tried to allay her worries, telling her that her grandmother was getting all the food, medicine, and other care she needed. But the woman couldn't shake the belief that something bad was happening. That night, she had a dream where her deceased grandfather appeared and told her to recheck her grandmother's charts. The next morning, she went to the facility, made the nurse check the charts, and to her amazement, the nurse saw that the night nurse had been giving her grandmother the wrong dosages of medicine. Once this cleared up, the grandmother immediately started to feel better. This woman had what's called a visitation dream. And this and other dreams that seem to come from mysterious places are the subject of today's episode. Our guide on this exploration is my special guest, Robert Haas, making a return visit to Dream Power Radio. Among his many accomplishments, Bob is an acclaimed author and teacher on dreams, the past president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, and director of its annual conference. Welcome back to Dream Power Radio, Bob. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) Well, Bob, this whole realm of dreams that seem to come from outside of ourselves has always fascinated me. When we have visitation dreams, like the one I just described, What's actually happening? I mean, was that woman really talking with her dead grandfather? Well, because it was uh, confirmed, basically, (laughs) sorry you told, it's probably a good chance that she was. What seems to be happening in these sorts of dreams is that our our consciousness really extends well beyond our physical and our physical brain. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later when we talk about near-death experiences and and the medical profession that was involved. But there is a thinking that our consciousness really expands well beyond the physical and into the spiritual realm. And that's basically, it seems to be what's happening. And in the dream state, we seem to be much more open to that, particularly in the state we've called lucid dreaming. Uh, because our rational, the rational part of our mind basically is essentially shut off or, or less active in the dream state. So it allows these things to come through without filtering. Mm. Well, the woman I referred to considered herself an active dreamer. But can somebody who usually doesn't remember their dreams also have dreams like this? Absolutely. It's just a little disappointing when you can't remember it. <laughs> but yeah, what occurs in dreaming, particularly the dreams we don't recall, is we're learning throughout the night about life and uh, adapting to life and whatnot. Fel- fairly well known among researchers that this learning process takes place, whether we recall the dream or not. And in that state, our minds are constantly looking forward to what if scenarios? What if we tried this out in life? How is that going to work? And the dream drags you through that. And it also, because of the expanded consciousness, allows us to bring in information that's basically outside the physical uh, into other realms. So we we have all these uh, this information and these much greater set of tools when we're dreaming than we're awake in uh, in the waking state well let's talking about visitation dreams in particular is there are there specific characteristics that are uh, associated with visitation dreams yes there are and there's a big difference uh, between visitation dreams true visitations and dreams that come to help us 
through the, the depression we might have and the grief we might have of a loved one passing. Quite often, in fact, I'm sure everyone who dreams and recalls their dreams remembers dreaming of someone who has passed beyond, either a, a loved one or a father, mother, a friend, whatever. They show up in our dreams quite often uh, just to kind of represent aspects of their personality that, that, we're de- that we might want to pay attention to it in terms of dealing with our own waking life issues. But when we are in a period of grieving after the death, quite often we will have dreams with these individuals in them. They're not necessarily visitations, but the dream is trying to help us through the grief process in this learning that I was talking about. It takes us through scenarios to help us learn. But sometimes those experiences are true visitations. And the difference seems to be is when there is a true visitation, it's sort of an electric experience. The person will wake up and say, I, it was real. I was really there. They were really there. It has this feeling of real lucidity in particular. And if you encounter the individual, a lot of times there's some hugging going on in those cases. It's like an electric soul to soul experience. And they kind of are there to show you that, yeah, they're doing fine. And so there's nothing to be sad about. I've had a number of those with, with loved ones that, that passed on. Give you an example if you like. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, this, this most of my loved ones that I have passed on before me recently, I've had uh, some degree of visitation. One of them was particularly tricky. I had a friend who he and I were did psychic experiments all our lives. And back in the old days where the phone system was just relays and stuff, we used to pick up the phone exactly at the same time to talk to each other, you know, <laughs> and we did it all the time. So we had this connection. And when he uh, passed on, I figured that if anybody's going to visit me, it's going to be him. Well, time drug on and oh, a month or so had passed. And I was thinking, Ooh, you know, I wonder why he hasn't visited me. And I started to begin to doubt this whole <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> and all of a sudden the night of my birthday, bingo I, I go I have a lucid dream and there he is standing there and he has his big grin on his face like gotcha <laughs> in fact that was the thought that came from him in the dream gotcha <laughs> you know it's like he was waiting for my birthday and we embraced each other and said boy we, I miss you and it was absolutely electric it, you know we merged as two souls so that's the kind of effects sometimes that come with true visitations I tell you, another area, which I I guess would be considered a visitation dream, uh, are dreams of the dying, where often they are visited by their own deceased loved ones. Uh, I mean, I've experienced this with my own relatives, and I found it's been a source of comfort when, you know, they realize what had happened. What are your thoughts about these type of dreams? They're called psychopompic dreaming. And... uh, Psychopompic is from an old Greek term that means guide to souls. In the seminar we're going to be doing at the upcoming conference, which I'll discuss a little later, we've got two people in the seminar with me talking about their psychopompic experiences. And uh, then we talk about visitation dreams and the near-death experience, the actual crossing over and back. But the psychopompic dream is is very interesting. Uh, These two individuals in many of their lucid dreams will find themselves crossing over and actually aiding a person who is passing and crossing over as well. Many people just cross over and get fairly well oriented, but many others do not. And they don't, some realize they haven't died, but they'll find themselves in an environment that they're somewhat comfortable with not realizing they've died, they've just accumulated the environment around them. And so the job of the psychopomp is to help orient these people as they, as they cross over and show them that they can move on, that they can change, that they can go into the light. Sometimes the dream doesn't get quite that far, but they have a visitation with the person in their stage of passing. Yeah, I know, just you know, my own uh, anecdotal experience of it, I found that people who've had these dreams, it it did help them, help them in in the process. 
Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, if you have some interest in reading some about psychopompic dreams, there's uh, one thing is you can come to the conference and listen to our seminar. But if you just go online and Google psychopompic dreaming, you'll find an article by Ed Kellogg there, which has a couple examples of some psych- psychopompic dreaming he had. Now, in the two dreams, he wasn't able to necessarily help the person go beyond, but he visited certain individuals. In one case, there was a guy that says, oh, we met you last night in heaven, <laughs> who <laughs> helped him to find uh, a friend who uh, had passed on many years uh, before, and they eventually uh, found the friend, uh, and the friend, and he told his friend, he says, well, you know, you have died, and his friend said, oh, no, I haven't, I've been reborn in three different planes, <laughs> so uh, very interesting experiences, but that's one that you can you can Google and grab hold of. Oh, yeah, and, and it does bring up the whole idea of what are we, what is our life? <laughs> what? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that, it was there was the one we were talking about visitation dreams. That my, my absolute favorite. I'm going to turn to the actual example here. This uh, woman, and I, I think it was in one of the lectures I was giving. She said at her workshop after my mother had passed. One night, I had a beautiful dream that my mother and I were being held up by flowing light and energy. Suddenly, there was a loud booming noise that shook me awake. She said, I was very shaken, thinking something had fallen down in the house or something. He says, shaken, I went into the living room to see if she was, if there was an intruder in the house. She says, as I returned down the hallway, there was my mother standing in the hallway, arms outspread and glowing. She looked at me and said, look at me, Beth, I'm a friggin' angel. <laughs> <laughs> So some of the times the, the visitation can not only extend from the dream, but also extend into the waking life for a moment. Yes, and and, and actually help the, the living person sort of cope with the whole experience as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, it, very much so. Another example, let me go back and go to that example for a second here, because I want to quote the exact words. This person had uh, some doubts about where their mother was, where they still about doubts about death, which we all do. We, you know, we, we don't necessarily know exactly what's going to happen, but he said, not long after my mother's death, I dreamed she was standing before me in front of a bright red curtains. She was young again. Now, many visitation dreams, this is another characteristic uh, of true visitations. The person looks young, perhaps at their peak of their, their existence. And anyway, she says she was young again and glowing radio, radiantly. She was excited to let me know she was still very much there. She smiled and said, Jane, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait until the curtain lifts. And at that moment, the curtain lifted in the in the dream. And there was a beautiful golden city and land of beauty and nature behind it. Oh, so, that that yeah. is beautiful. And that's a beautiful way to end this segment. We okay. are talking about visitation dreams and other otherworldly dreams with Robert Haas. And we'll be right back. If you're not pleased with the trajectory of your life, the time to begin your own personal transformation is now, and your dreams can help pave the way. How? By tapping into your unvoiced confidence. What is unvoiced confidence, you say? It's acceptance of your abilities and qualities. It's a state of mind coming from liking and even loving yourself, and feeling free to say or do anything you want without concern for the judgment of others. You were born confident, but may have had it chipped away little by little by the negative self-beliefs you've picked up over the years. If you're looking for the heightened energy, clarity of thought, and the feeling of being more alive that comes from self-confidence, you can rediscover it by paying attention to your dreams. Need some help doing this? Go to my website, thedreamcoach.net, and sign up for my complimentary dream discovery session. I can help show you how your dreams can help you return to the confident person you were always meant to be. Again, go to thedreamcoach.net, thedreamcoach.net. Welcome back to Dream Power Radio with your host, Debbie Specter weissman Yes, welcome back to Dream Power Radio. I'm your host, Debbie Specter weissman and we're talking about 
Dreams from a Different Dimension with dream expert, master, author, all things dream, Robert Haas. Uh, well, Bob, I want to talk to you about next, the experience of out-of-body experiences or OBEs. Uh, are they considered dreams? Well, the out-of-body experience is just another state of our extended consciousness. We like to tend to put things in categories of dreams and awaking, non-dreams, et cetera. But really, our consciousness extends into you know, various realms. So this is just one more state of consciousness. They're a little different than dreams because near-death experiences usually occur when a person's brain has been clinically uh, listed as clinically dead. So, uh, whereas in dreams, a lot of our brain is still very, very active. But the consciousness itself seems to extend beyond the brain, okay? And what a near-death experience is, it's usually, it's a, quite often a person will have a heart attack or be in an accident or something, and they will find themselves either floating above their body and looking down at whatever operation is taking place, or they will find themselves in generally a very beautiful, heavenly-like environment. Not anything they necessarily anticipated or expected, but a beautiful heavenly environment. And, and this occurs quite often when the brain is labeled as, as clinically dead. They can't find any brain activity whatsoever going on. It's even happened with um, in one case with a person who had an, an aneurysm and they drained all the blood from the brain. So it, basically it says, look, there was no operation going on there. You could not remember or even uh, lay down these memory experiences uh, because there was nothing left left in the brain to try to lay down that experience. So as a result of this, there's about, a, I, I studied about 4,000, I didn't say personally, I studied the literature on about 4,000 cases. Um, and these, these situations have led the medical community, particularly those who do these resuscitations a lot, to basically admitting that, hey, consciousness seems to extend beyond the physical brain. And our memories seem to as well. So it's a state of consciousness that we find ourselves in usually when we're in, a, in some sort of crisis, like we've had an accident or we're going through an operation under anesthesia or, or whatnot. But the experience, is, the, the interesting thing about the experience is when you look at all the research, and like I said, I, I studied about 4,000 different cases of research in this case, and the experience is common. Regardless of what culture you're in, what your religious belief is, et cetera. I'll name a, a few of the, there's about nine to 12 different common characteristics of all of them. About a quarter of them begin with an out of body experience. You're floating up a, and you can describe everything going on at, from a position that you couldn't have possibly seen on the table that you're in. You can describe the whole operation. About 95% overall, de depending on the different studies, were pure peace and ecstasy when the person leaves. And this is what for Christians and atheists in these studies, it, it didn't matter what your belief system was or expectation. And even the good or bad, <laughs> you might call it, dying prisoners had the similar kinds of experiences as the rest of the population. You know, very uh, pleasant sort of experience. There's usually a crossing of a barrier of some sort. Sometimes it was that tunnel that Hollywood likes to produce, but it could have been stairs or any sort of border crossing. There's about half in one study heard the celestial music in the air, but 20 to 32 percent were usually reuni reunited with loved ones. And uh, in one case, a uh, fellow named Eben Al Alexander, who was a a neurologist who went through one of these experiences, wrote the book, uh, Heaven is Real. He was united with a guide the whole way, didn't know who it was until after he he'd spent seven days in this. And he had a situation where the cortex of his brain was not operational. But after he got out of this, he, re he got some pictures from his family and realized that was his sister who had died before he was ever alive. So there's generally um, some sort of a, a guiding presence there. Uh, there's just usually a life review about only about 62%. We all don't all do it. But in this particular study, 100% the Christians were in the 62% range and the atheists were 100%. So I guess they had a lot to think about. 75%, and it was the same percentage roughly with Christians or atheists, met a divine being who 
uh, embrace them with unconditional love. Now, of course, depending on their belief system, they would identify it as some would identify as Jesus. If they're Christian, some would identify as just this, uh, this uh, divine being or this extra powerful being or whatever. But it was basically the, the similar experience. Many were purely unexpected experiences. That is, they went against their belief systems and um, 40 in these experiences, but uh, 46 percent were told that they were not ready and usually, and uh, had to go back. And this was almost always reluctantly, <laughs> but so nice being there. And about 80% of these experiences transformed the individual completely. And some of them made a very hard time adjusting back to real life, but there was more empathy. There was no, it removed the fear of death, of course, from these individuals. So very common among all cultures and all individuals. Yeah, I, I would think having that fear of death removed me. I think I would say everybody fears death, but don't even think about it because it's easier not to think about it than, than dealing with it. But there's an underlying thought of what's going to happen and how am I going to deal with it and all of that sort of thing. But since the body is there and, you know, the, the consciousness leaves the body, what does that say about our consciousness? I mean, is it everywhere? Well, I guess the prevailing thought from all of this is a question. Are we spiritual beings inhabiting a body or are we a body with a, with a spirit? And this appears to answer the question toward more in the direction of we're spiritual beings, we're conscious entities, conscious energy inhabiting a body. So uh, it, when you think of about that and any, even uh, biblical scholars uh, can find phrases like that in the Bible itself that talks about how we are of the spirit. So uh, when you think about it like that, it, it seems to not be so surprising. Well, another area where we kind of are leaving our bodies, although we're not because we do it while we're in the sleep state, is lucid dreaming. So can you talk a little bit about you know, what happens in a lucid dream? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> lucid, lucid dreaming is my favorite type of dreaming. <laughs> uh, in, in a lucid dreaming, what, it, what it's really occurring, it's not totally mystical, even though the experience is certainly mystical, is that parts of our brain that are normally uh, asleep in the REM sleep state all of a sudden become active. And this is mainly the frontal areas, the brain, some other areas responsible for memory memory and whatnot, and that parietal region starts to activate, which is normally inactive in the REM state. In the REM state, when we dream, most of the inner part of our brain uh, is is highly active, processing emotional, emotional problems of the day. But suddenly, if this frontal area becomes active, which is responsible for our state of consciousness in the waking state, suddenly we wake up in our dreams. We don't wake up totally because the rest of the brain is still inactive, but uh, we wake up in our dreams. And what it does is it allows the ego to wander through the dream state. The ego doesn't control the dream. You can control little things here and there, but you can influence it. You can control your own actions. But generally, the dream is still greater than you because it represents a bigger part of yourself. But you, but being in control, you suddenly start realizing a few things or, or being able to influence things. One is if you and this is what I really like to do is to turn around and realize that there is this divine wisdom, you might call it, or this greater wisdom behind the dream. And Jung called it the collective unconscious. You turn around and say, show me something I need to know, something very open-ended, or, or what, sh what should I do? Show me what I should do in this situation. And what will happen is the dream will sparkle into a new lucid dream with generally an answer to your particular question. And, and, you know, that is fabulous because now you have a way of, you have a guide to help you sort out things in life that you might not have thought about. I think that's a great resource and a great way to use lucid dream. But isn't it true that the two most common lucid dreams that people have are flying dreams and sex dreams? That's what you usually <laughs> 
<laughs> when, when people realize they're lucid in, in a magical state, that's the two things that people will usually try to do. But what I'm saying is that, okay, that might be a lot of fun, but after a while, turn around and talk to the person that you're trying to have relations with, ask them who they are, where they came from, what they're trying to show you. And all of a sudden you're going to get, you're going to go deeper into your own self. Cause a lot of times there are parts of yourself that need to be joined. That's what the sex is all about. It's parts of other parts of yourself that you've alienated that are trying to rejoin you. Uh, and, and so you get in touch with that. And also with the wisdom, I, then I think I shared one of the stories I had with of the great heart at, at the end of my lucid dream that one time. My wife has dementia, and so I went lucid one night, and I realized that I could ask this wisdom what I should do. So I turned around in the dream, and I turned to the wisdom, and I said, show me what I need to get through this situation. And I was pulled up into this beautiful celestial you know, oneness, crystalline blue light with all this celestial music in the background. And it, it was so blissful that I forgot who I was or why I was there. And all of a sudden, these little red hearts started forming around in a circle in this blue environment and behind me. And they formed this giant red heart. But I could hear a tune in the background. And as I carefully listened, the tune increased. And it was the Beatles, all you need is love. So I got my answer. But that's the kind of thing that can happen if you, you know, quit flying around and having sex in your dream. <laughs> Just go ahead and ask the wisdom. You know, the time is flying, and I wanted to get to this before we had to leave, but I mentioned earlier that you were the director for the annual conference for the International Association for the Study of the Dream. So can you give us a brief preview of what we might expect this year? Yes, the conference is on site in Tucson, Arizona. It's going to be uh, Sunday through Thursday, July 17th through the 21st. It's at the Bantana Canyon Resort, which is a most fabulous, one of the most fabulous resorts in Arizona. Uh, $115 per room night, plus you can stay before and after for a few days at the same rate. So you can make a vacation out of it. We're, we're featuring uh, about seven different keynotes. Edward Bruce Bynum talking about African mysticism and dreams, Jeanette Maggio talking about pandemic dreams, and Dr. Ruben Naiman, the impact of dream loss and collective consciousness, Stephen LaBerge. Now, this is great because Stephen LaBerge was one of the two original pioneers in lucid dream research, and he's going to be talking about his whole history of uh, dream research and that in lucid dream research. Dr. Michelle Carr is going to be talking about nightmares of lucid dreams. She's our president this year. Catherine Sheinberg is going to be talking about Kabbalah dreaming, co-creation, enlightenment. And Deidre Barrett uh, is going to be talking a talk called Dark of Night, which is all about COVID-19 pandemic. She's from Harvard University and does uh, has done a whole series of research on pandemic dreaming so it is exciting in a nutshell. I, I can't wait and it, it's going to be in person this year which is even better so yeah well, i should probably give the web, yeah. website just just go on to asdreams.org that's asdreams dot org www.asdreams.org and on there will be a button you can click to get to our conference information that is fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being on Dream Power Radio today. And thank you. Hey, we've been speaking with dream researcher and author Robert Haas. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. If you have, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future shows. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector Weissman saying, Sweet dreams, everybody. You've been listening to Dream Power Radio with your host, Debbie Spector Weissman. For more information on Debbie or to sign up for her newsletter, go to dreampowerradio.com. This has been Dream Power Radio.